Welcome. I'm C.C. Warham, uh, the director of the Humanities Se uh, Center here at EIU. And the first people I always thank are the people in the hall because you have many choices of how you're going to spend your 6 p.m. hour on a Tuesday uh, evening. And you decided to come out and hear a humanities lecture. Good for you. You're going to be better for it. Uh, you're better than all those people who aren't in the hall. <laughs> and atypically, though, I'm actually going to thank the people who are not in the hall, because since we're actually live streaming this event uh, through the tubes of you, uh, to far fun places across the Phi Beta Kappa Association network. So everybody wave, g turn around and wave to the people inside the camera over there. Very good. Yeah, you're actually doing it. I didn't know that. That's surprising to me. Uh, and I have no idea how many there are there. But for you over there, um, and the reason I'm holding this microphone is for them, not for you is uh, so that they can ask questions as well. There'll be a question and answer period after our guest speaker, Scott Samuelson, gives his lecture. And those folks over there can also participate by uh, asking us some questions. Um, for those who've been in the lecture hall for a wee while now, you've been listening to our pre-talk playlist, brought to you by folks who wrote and performed songs after they knew they were going to die. Uh, you heard David Bowie's Black Star, Bob Marley's Bad Card, Leonard Cohen's You Want It Darker, Joy Division's Love Will Tear Us Apart, and Call on God by Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. All those artists were confronting death when they wrote and performed those songs, so I thought it fitting with tonight's topic, Kicking the Bucket, Death, Human Mortality, that we listen to some beauty that came about because of that confrontation with death. Um, for those of you who have joined our Being Mortal book, uh, community book club readings, and you know that talking about death and beauty, mortality and meaning doesn't have to be a downer. We had some rather meaningful and, I will say it, fun conversations about death over the past year and a half, and we're all delighted that Scott Samuelson could be with us here today to move the conversation forward. And for those who would like to join in and to discuss seven ways of looking at pointless suffering, this stunningly well-written book that you're going to hear something about tonight, go to our center web pages or talk to me afterwards and you can sign up for something. You can just come t talk to me afterwards and say, I really want to do that. I want to get involved in that. I know that many of you, I've seen many of you already who have already done that and signed up. I have your names. You don't have to talk to me. Well, you can still talk to me afterwards, but you don't have to talk to me about that. So we've got a a good group of people that are interested in doing that will set up at least one, probably two uh, times that we can talk about that in the coming weeks, okay? Um, before I forget, I want to note that tonight's lecture is made possible by, this is the uh, advertising part of it, the Redden Fund for Improving Undergraduate Instruction. We're very grateful to the people at Redden for always supporting undergraduate instruction here at EIU. And in part by a grant from Illinois Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Illinois General Assembly. I do want to thank Alan Picaro of the Art Department for making our poster. He has the poster club. Uh, I think it was too early in the semester for the poster club to actually be a part of this. So I think this is a Picaro original, uh, but I could be wrong about that. But I've made it a habit to engage in a little poster semiotics class before lectures begin to bore you a little bit. Mostly because I think the fine art of postering is an under underappreciated thing. And before these ephemeral pages make go to that recycling station in the sky, I wanted to talk about the sort of their eulogize maybe their value, their beauty in some ways. The image is the image behind there is a mashup of uh, Plato and Aristotle together. He's sort of like kind of made out of a ruined one image, um, at, for obvious reasons. If you've actually looked at um, uh, Scott Samuelson's book. Not that you had to to come here tonight. I hope many of you are unfamiliar with his work and will be pleasantly surprised. Uh, the stylized shapes, uh, according to Picaro, represented sort of a tipping bucket and the list down on the bottom. Now, I had to argue with him because when I looked at it, I saw the, the, 
the black shape as sort of the window of a prison cell and that the bars were kind of like falling away because I thought that was a really symbolic way of looking at what's going on. And of course, the inheritors of the Socratic, you know, the Socrates who was in a prison cell, of course, uh, I thought that that made sense, but he tells me I'm wrong, but I think he's wrong. But in any case, <laughs> semiotics of postering, lesson complete. Um, and of course, I want to thank the good people of Doudna, Dean Shelton, of course, Dennis Malik, Dan Cruz, Chris Burke for helping us with the PBK live feed, Joseph back there helping out. I want a, just a brief reminder that after the talk is over, you can purchase some books, not only this one, but another great book that is out there that you'll hear a little bit about in a second. Uh, and there will be a reception at Shea Moi and Shea Park, uh, 1102 Monroe Avenue. 1102 Monroe Avenue uh, after the talk. You're all invited to come. If you all come, it'll be a little bit squishy, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, you're certainly welcome, though, and it'll be a good problem to have. With that, I will hand it over to the president. You're, are you the president of the uh, Phi Beta Kappa Association of East Central Illinois? Yes. Is that correct? Yes, as far as I know. Uh, so please uh, say something about, <laughs> please welcome Susie Park. Thank you. Just, you just have to use it so that they can hear us. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Welcome to the 28th Annual Phi Beta Kappa Fall Lecture. My name is Susie Park. I have the great pleasure of serving as a Phi Beta Kappa National Senator and as the President of the Alumni Association of East Central Illinois, housed here at Eastern Illinois University. I thank the EIU Humanities Center, the Redden Foundation, and the PBK members who have donated so generously every year to PBK events. At the national and the local level, Phi Beta Kappa, the nation's premier and very first honor society, is doing amazing things in its relentless yet charming advocacy for the value and pure love of learning, and particularly the value of learning in the liberal arts and sciences. Broaden the mind, challenge yourself and others to be excellent, seek friendship, all in the service of the human species. Speaking of friendship, I will be the first to admit that bringing out and hosting a scholar in Charleston, Illinois, is the most time-intensive way to make new friends. There's got to be an easier way, right? No, there isn't. It's like speed dating for academics. It's really not that speedy. And the date goes on for the rest of one's academic career. First, there is the romance period in which the mellifluous words and brilliant thoughts of the scholar's research and writing are too good to be real. Then there is the vetting period. Do I or do I not ask this scholar to the prom? <laughs> Finally, there is the wooing and negotiation period. Will this scholar not only attend prom, but also hold the interest of an audience about mortality, a topic as heavy as molasses. Dr. Scott Samuelson is a fierce and most eloquent champion of humanities for the people. Inducted into Phi Beta Kappa at Grinnell College, where he was valedictorian, by the by, and having earned his PhD in philosophy at Emory University, Dr. Samuelson is now a philosophy pr professor at Kirkwood Community College in Iowa City. The title of his dissertation, The Quarrel Between Poetry and Philosophy, was just a preview of the life he has led since then of embracing the highly productive quarrel between words and thoughts, between expression and logic, between two ways of engaging with and disengaging from the world. In his work teaching philosophy to prisoners in Iowa, in publishing articles like Why I Teach Plato to Plumbers in the Atlantic, and Would You Hire Socrates in the Wall Street Journal, and in his two beautifully written books published by the University of Chicago Press, The Deepest Human Life and Seven Ways of Looking at Pointless Suffering out there for sale, it is no surprise that Dr. Dr. Samuelson was awarded the very prestigious Hyatt Prize in the Humanities from the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture. What you may not immediately glean from his stellar public and academic work is just how attuned he is to living a full, good, and meaningful life himself. In typical philosopher mode, he told me this morning that life is difficult. Of course, he hadn't finished his coffee yet. 
And then he recalled the time when he was trying to find a suitable home for his book, The Deepest Human Life, which is a book about why philosophy is integral to, not divorced from, being human. He refused to work with agents who asked him, in so many words, to dumb down his writing. Respecting his audience too much, his audience being everyone in the public, you and me, it makes sense that he didn't want his gravestone to read. He dumbed it all down for them. <laughs> from his scholarship and from his life's work in teaching, it is clear that asking the truly big questions about being human centered on death, suffering, justice, and love requires not just what he calls the fix-it attitude, propelling such areas of knowledge like the sciences and, the te and technology, but also, and more urgently, the face-it attitude underlying the disciplines of the arts and humanities. The fix-it disciplines and the liberal arts more generally, as he writes, mean, quote, cutting through the crap and trying to see things as they are, where honest questioning is better than easy answering, where contradictions in the name of trying to get things right are preferable to harmonies that paper things over. In other words, it's the practice of philosophy, science, literature, and the rest of the liberal arts, not simply as a bunch of ideas to be memorized and mastered, not simply as handy tools for getting jobs and manipulating nature, and definitely not as a bunch of fancy theories that explain everything, but as adventures of understanding, end quote. I'll close with just one more description of Scott Samuelson, one less philosophical, or is it? Drinker of wine, worshiper of Bacchus, <laughs> French sous chef in a large farmhouse restaurant in Iowa, lover of blues music. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Scott Samuelson. Thank you so much, that was lovely. I will go to the prom with you. Yeah, we're all close. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, and thank you to Susie Park and to C.C. Warham uh, for their generous hospitality and to the Redden Foundation for their generosity as someone who's proudly Phi Beta Kappa. It's, I'm really delighted to be giving this lecture in this lovely building. Um, I'm going to jump right in here. Uh, my talk is called Kicking the Bucket List, Death in the Art of Shining, and I have a little epigraph from Marion Milner, uh, I'll mention her a little later in my paper, but she wrote this uh, a book in her late 20s about 100 years ago. Uh, and towards the beginning, she says, I want to feel I have lived. But what on earth do I mean by that? I mean something silly and Sunday paperish, like plumbing the depths of human experience. What nonsense it sounds. I suppose I've got a Sunday paper mind. I don't want a life of service to a good cause, so it's no good pretending I do. Maybe it's colossal egotism, but I want to share in everything in the world, the bad as well as the good. The world is so marvelous. I want to grasp it, to partake of it, to embrace it, to feel every part of me vibrating with it. Do I? What are the things I want to share in? As I was writing the last thing I'll say to you in this talk, I heard a ruckus. Someone was frantically asking an airline attendant to phone for help. I was in the Dallas airport waiting on a connection to Memphis where I was scheduled to give a talk on studying the humanities called, What Are You Going to Do With That? About 10 yards in front of me, I saw an obese woman slouched over in her chair. She didn't seem to be breathing. Shamefully, my first thought was, I hope someone else deals with this. But she was heavy enough that several people were going to be needed, so I rushed over and, with the improvised help of a few others, lowered her to the ground. All I could recall from the mists of health class was to clear the throat, so I lifted her chin and tilted her head to the side. Before I could fish around in her mouth, a slew of yellow-green fluid poured out like a two-liter of flat Mountain Dew had just been knocked over. The woman's companion screamed she just had an operation. While the passenger next to me began chest compressions, I held her head in my hands. Do you know the first lyric of the oldest surviving musical composition? While you live, shine. While you live, shine. The song continues, 
Life exists just a little while, and time demands his due. As the Good Samaritan next to me pumped away at CPR, officials of American Airlines whipped out a giant curtain, formed a circle around the scene, and held the veil as high as they could. Perhaps they're instructed to cordon off emergencies to protect the privacy of those who suffer, but it struck me as a way of hiding the truth of that old song so the bustle of business could proceed apace. In the few infinite minutes before the medics arrived, we occasionally poked for a pulse. The truth is she was probably dead by the time we laid her on the floor. In the aftermath of the woman's exit on a stretcher, I prayed that she had shown. I wanted to let my own little light shine. Embarrassed at how absentmindedly I'd been loving those I love, I zapped out a few I love you texts, though I knew that those words were lukewarm without a present-minded way of living up to their promise. My son texted back, love you too, Padre. Returning to my computer, which blessedly hadn't been stolen, I saved the changes to what are you going to do with that. Thank God that after several millennia of hints and guesses, we remain clueless as cavemen about life's flip side. If we knew how it all added up, life would be as boring as a sheet of arithmetic problems. All we know of death is a tiny truth, a hugely important tiny truth. We're all going to die. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls, John Donne reminds us. It tolls for thee. Though our eventual fate can be known with all the certainty of the IRS in April, isn't it easy to cordon off that truth from how we spend our time? We know the fact, but ignore the significance. We treat our mortality with something like that yeah, 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 eye roll of teenagers. In the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, the wise hero Yudhistrata must answer a riddle posed by a divine crane. Of all the world's wonders, what's the most wonderful? His answer, that people, though they see others dying all around them, never believe that they're going to die. The American airline curtain goes up, and we bumble to our gate as if the best way to shine were to pretend the truth isn't true. As Bob Dylan slyly puts it in his late song, Standing in the Doorway, I can hear the church bells ringing in the yard. I wonder who they're ringing for. I call this approach the forget about it attitude. <laughs> when we do confront the fact of our mortality, our culture's default setting seems to be a fix it mentality. We call in the medics, we pour our energies into curing diseases and extending life, we debate the funding of health care while another wing of the hospital goes up. Like you, I am the grateful beneficiary of this fix it quest. But, as wonderful as we are at manufacturing pills and transplanting organs, let's face it, our society's relationship to death and dying can often be unhealthy. We get so into fixing the machine that we forget we're living in a body. The more we regard grief, old age, pain, and death as glitches, the more medicine is inclined to anesthetize all trying conditions, keep us young indefinitely, hide away, the suffering and the old, and put off our deaths beyond even the point when our lives are meaningful. The more we believe technology can fix every problem, the more we regard nature as a mere resource for our enhanced power, or else as a pet to keep locked up in a park. Interestingly, the more we see our life as a mechanism to be fixed, the more our entertainment is filled with spectacular, dreamlike appearances of death and violence, from zombies to mortal combat. I worry that we're forgetting what it means to exist. For instance, by the time I returned from washing up in the restroom, the airport floor had already been cleaned, and everything at the gate had returned to normal appearance-wise. I was jacked up, trembling. When the loudspeaker clicked on, I straightened up, half expecting an acknowledgement of what had just gone down, a verification of the death of the woman whose head I had held maybe even some human-sounding words about it. I didn't know what I wanted exactly, but I wanted something big, something like a New Orleans jazz funeral to march by and coordinate all my turmoil and excitement. What came over the loudspeaker was this. 
In a few minutes, we'll begin the boarding process, starting with our concierge key members, followed by active duty U.S. military with a military ID, and then our executive platinum, platinum pro, and gold customers. Those words weren't exactly commensurate with my wonder. Fix it hadn't worked, so we'd gone right back to forget about it, even though death doesn't board people by their group number, and our fellow passenger had just departed for somewhere unscheduled from DFW. After the fix it and forget about it attitudes, what remains is the face it approach. Exactly what I wasn't getting at gate C23. The face it approach characterizes much of religion, art, and the humanities, but also a significant portion of science and even politics. This attitude regards nature as something that we must suffer to become who we're meant to be. Confrontations with pain, misery, and death are necessary initiations into a deeper way of being. With our face it energies, we go through tough times, often not wanting to deal with them, and they become a crucial part of our story. We take risks and discover whole new worlds of value. We increase our humanity by showing up for the suffering and the bereaved. We tingle with pleasure in contemplating the universe as it is, not as we wish it were. We learn to love by confronting our mortality. The darkness of suffering falls, and we find joys that can't be darkened. At our most inspired, we transform death and suffering into profound art, culture, and knowledge, and elevate our confused grief into glittering visions of beauty, adventure, and salvation. The forget about it, fix it, and face it attitudes are all basic to the human condition. As necessary as it is sometimes simply to ignore our mortality is to hollow out our lives. Simply to face death while renouncing any efforts to prolong life is heartless. We shirk our power to better our condition. We become complacent personally and politically in the face of suffering. But simply to prolong life without any effort to face death is shallow. We lose the ability to enrich ourselves through the difficulties tragedies, and vulnerabilities at the heart of all meaningful things. What's the balance between fixing, facing, and forgetting death? There's no perfect formula, but my hunch is that we could enhance our lives by facing it more than we do. On the afternoon of his execution, Socrates, enjoying a leisurely conversation, says, those who apply themselves in the right way to philosophy are directly and of their own accord preparing themselves for dying and death. Philosophy here doesn't mean sitting in a classroom with a crazy-haired professor or slogging through a jargon-laden tome, at least not necessarily. It refers to something Socrates thinks everyone is capable of, the art of cutting the crap, honestly seeking out what's most valuable, and living a life in tune with the search. So let's dial back the yeah, 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 and do some philosophy. You and I are going to die, we don't know when, and there's no contract on the back of our ticket stipulating that death will wait for us until we've made all our connections. How are we to shine? When we do bring a little of death's reality into our face at consciousness, our society likes a bucket list, a wish list of things we'd like to do before we kick the bucket. It comes out of a good motive, and it certainly isn't all bad, but it doesn't get at what's truly valuable in our limited time. As splendid as is kite surfing in Oahu, or making out atop the Eiffel Tower, or holding a human brain in your hands, our lives aren't pails that can be filled with meaning if we pour in enough splashy, disconnected experiences. In shop class's Soulcraft, Matthew Crawford talks about the easy-bake oven of consumerism. He derives the name from Betty Crocker, whose genius was to see that we don't just want to buy a cake. We want to buy the identity of a baker, since we don't have the wherewithal to practice that identity ourselves. So Betty Crocker prepackages the loving identity we long for. Just mix in some eggs and water, and poof, you're a baker of homemade delectables. As Crawford points out, nearly all products are marketed in this manner. Consumer goods cry out to us through our medias, megaphones. Buy me, and I'll give you the identity you long for. To put it even more cynically, buy me, and I'll give you the identity that the crappy job you did to pay for me stole from you. 
The bucket list has a bit of the easy bake oven to it. Acquire me and I'll make your life sufficiently interesting. It's a consumerist model of the good life. Indeed, what often keeps people from crossing items off their bucket list is insufficient funds, as if the good life had a price tag on it. We dream that we'll be able to face death with equanimity if we possess enough selfies in far-flung places. Failing that, we crack open a Dos Equis, what the most interesting man in the world drinks when he's drinking beer. Look, I'm all for kite surfing and kissing in new places, and I've even held a human brain in my hands, which was, I confess, on my bucket list. Um, <laughs> but bucket list experiences aren't what the art of shining is really about. They're symbols of deeper hungers as for love and adventure, which don't come prepackaged and can't be encompassed by the panorama function on your phone. So once we've kicked the bucket list, how are we to imagine a worthwhile life? In the book, A Life of One's Own, an underappreciated classic from 1934, Marion Milner uh, explores her own mind to see how far she can understand happiness and welcome it into her life. After she gets back past what she calls her Sunday paper mind, what we might now call our smartphone mind, she realizes that happiness doesn't have much to do with possessions, lifestyles, social standing, or even accomplishments. It's about paying attention. She figures out through trial and error how to open the valves of her consciousness and experiences, quote, a feeling of happiness which was far beyond what I had ordinarily meant by enjoying myself. I've come to much the same thing in the wake of that sudden death in the Dallas airport. I don't want to waste my being here. I want to be awake to the shimmering look and feel and sound and smell and taste of nature and culture. I want to tune in to all the astonishing people of the world. I want to let my mind loose and discover its surprises. I want to open myself to all those things that strike the heart without leaving a bruise and even to a few things that strike the heart and scar. As I was reading Milner and taking the airport's lesson to heart, it dawned on me that a certain form of paying attention is exactly what ancient philosophers like Aristotle regard as the highest form of human flourishing. They call it contemplation and describe it as activating the divinity in us, which sounds highfalutin. Indeed, contemplation can soar us to the altitudes where we theorize space-time or prove God, but this angel-winged endeavor takes place in all acts of paying attention to things because they're there, in all moments of being dialed into the world outside our heads and deep inside our brains. Divine ecstasies ensue when we savor the apple rather than wolf it down, or when we listen to our interlocutors rather than plan our next story while they're talking. My hunch is that when most people genuinely accept their terminal condition, rather than run out and book a ticket to Oahu, they take up something like the contemplative life, savoring the sunlight in the apple and smiling at the foibles of their friends and family in gracious acceptance of the gifts existence has still to lavish. Though our schools may have forgotten it, a good education is all about the practice and cultivation of our attention. As Michael Oakeshott says, education is not acquiring a stock of ready-made images, ideas, sentiments, beliefs, and so forth. It is learning to look, to listen, to think, to feel, to imagine, to believe, to understand, to choose, and to wish. A good education helps to enlarge our attention spans, to call our attention to what matters, to center our attention on particulars, to free our attention to chart new connections, to exemplify what it means to lavish attention on a passionate pursuit, and to give us vocabularies and crafts that activate our best modes of attention. Tragically, our schools often degrade arts and crafts as specials and distort the sciences and the humanities as vehicles for quantifiable objectives when in fact these subjects are a priceless inheritance of paying attention to being alive and having to die. As far as I can tell, we're often shuffling students as fast as we can in the opposite direction of the good life. It's like we're trying to make them into intelligent robots to do jobs that will soon be done by 
actual intelligent robots. <laughs> Kingdoms of old plundered the riches of the earth and the manpower of the conquered. The emerging empires seem to be those able to divide and conquer our attention. The war is on, especially when we're plugged into an addictive medium that markets our addiction. Unlike the subjugated of the past, we happily sell ourselves into slavery. Why? Well, maybe because our screens and their algorithms promise us precisely what they've conditioned us to desire. Maybe because life is hard and Twitter is easy. Maybe because time takes a toll and Facebook is free. Maybe because we don't want to shine. At one point in a life of one's own, Marion Milner thinks back to how when she was 15, she sat down to draw a picture of what she feared most. The sketch that emerged was of a dragon. After free associating with the idea of dragon, the adult Milner realizes what it symbolized. She says, I began to see it as a fear that my personal identity would be swallowed up. And then gradually I began to feel sure that it was really this fear which had me purpose-driven. I had the desire always to be getting things done to prove to myself that I existed as a person at all. So it was only very rarely that I had felt safe enough to give up striving, particularly as the enemy was really within my own gates. My hunch is that our screen addictions and identity politics have something to do with that dragon and the incessant desire to prove we exist. The enemy is very much within our gates. We can't face death, so we lead blank staring lives. So we must prove we exist. So we're prone to selling ourselves out for easily manipulated virtual identities that promise recognition, justice, love, greatness. The first step out of this predicament is to break out and pursue a real identity, one able to do battle with that dragon and win us genuine recognition, justice, love, greatness. A real identity is a tricky business involving a complicated dance between our available roles and our unique gifts where the dancer and the dance are fused. There's a whole lot that could be said of this ever ramifying tango, about its embraces of work and play, about its reversals of struggle and joy, about its responsive virtuosity. I'm going to focus on just one part of it, the idea of a calling. As far as defeating the dragon of self-doubt, there's perhaps no more central task than to find your callings and dance with them. To figure out your callings, I'm using the plural because I think most of us have a few callings, requires first and foremost a specific attention to yourself and an open-minded attention to the possibilities. I don't think you can really know yourself in the noise of distraction. The term calling suggests the need for listening, for paying attention to what demands our song and makes us sing. You must unplug from the distractions and enter the musical silence that some find in prayer, some in meditation, and some in the act of thinking. A calling's presence is confirmed when not only are you attracted to a path despite its difficulties, you're drawn to the path precisely because of its dangers. Though we all go through anxious spells when no path calls, or when our callings are destructive rather than affirming, I'm particularly worried about young people who see no healthy prospects for their sense of adventurousness. My hunch is that most people eventually get a sense of their general callings. You usually come to know if you're cut out for the playing of music, or the pursuit of justice, or the pickling of cabbage, or all of the above. The difficulty is knowing what to do with your general callings. They can get crossed with each other and with the workaday duties that accompany them. Plus, there's often an ambivalence at the core of who we are, a divergence of two or more roads that lay claim on us. A certain amount of random striking off is necessary to find in retrospect that the road taken is indeed your calling or not. I'm one of the lucky ones whose profession has turned out to be their calling, and I still struggle with what to do with it. There's the constant danger of second best fates. Not only have I been tempted by modish approaches to philosophy and pussyfooting ways of writing, I regularly wonder how best to use my gifts. Risk is intimately related to calling, and one of the many dangers is the allure of easy paths and poppy fields. One virtue I try to summon is courage, the courage to make myself vulnerable to my fate. 
Another is the ability to laugh at myself because, well, a lot of my cakes have, turned into, have to be turned into puddings. Paying attention to the world and pursuing our callings are both central to the art of shining. And maybe they're even two sides of the same coin. For the pursuit of a calling requires our full attention, what Auden calls that eye on the object look. And our fundamental calling as rational animals is to pay attention. But doing what we're supposed to be doing requires a lot of not doing it. One thing that Milner discovers is that she can't just flip on the switch of attention. Trying to stare at the world often backfires and throws us right back into distraction. Much like the child on the bike trying to avoid the thorn bush often rides right into the thorn bush. To cultivate attention, Milner finds, requires a certain amount of letting go. It also requires being in a mental and physical place where we can tune in. To put the matter bluntly, it's hard to pursue your callings if you're sleep deprived or constipated. What a good life needs is rhythm. Rhythm, in fact, seems to be the great lesson of existence, from the in-out of breath to the there-back of bird migrations to the up-down of the tapping toe. We need to learn the old lesson from Ecclesiastes that everything has its tempo, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. We've been pondering the question of the good life, but that's not actually the best approach. A better version of the question is probably, what's a good week? You could almost say, what's a good day? Though I'm not sure if you should cram the whole human journey into 24 hours. Even if you can, as a James Joyce novel suggests, I'm not sure you want every day to be the be-all and end-all. I myself need the occasional day off from the Odyssey. However, I do think you can have a good life in a good week. Seven days, even if you have a dumb job, though I sure hope you don't, is enough time to perform all the essential verbs. Making, loving, eating, sleeping, bathing, thinking, reading, doing, laboring, working, playing, laughing, crying, wandering. A week provides ample material for a good story or two, plenty of time for a little intoxication. There's still time, even after all that, to waste some time for good measure. William Blake encourages us to see the world in a grain of sand. I think most of us need six or seven grains of sand to see the world. Rhythm is the key. Some of this, some of that, time for one thing, time for another. A one, a two, a one, two, three. It all depends on the peculiarities of your situation. But here's the funny thing. The more you meaningfully do, the more time you seem to have. The people with the least amount of time often aren't accomplishing much of anything. Do the important stuff and time sprawls out before you. Do the piddly stuff and you never have enough time to do the piddly stuff, let alone all that you've dreamt of. Festina lente, as the old Latin adage has it, make haste leisurely. The beauty of rhythm is that it keeps time. In her late, later years, my grandma hardly did anything with her time, but I remember once calling her up about visiting for a week and she panicked because that week she already had a dentist appointment at 2.30 on Thursday. <laughs> I get it. As a teacher, I'm blessed and cursed with a few months off. I'm pretty good about structuring a summer, but somehow I always end up with two weeks of doing nothing. Those are the two weeks that I, like my grandma, have the least time for anything. When a colleague asks me for a half hour meeting on Thursday afternoon, I feel like it's ruining my whole week. It's the opposite of the Latin adage, I'm harried doing nothing. But when I'm in the swing of things, doing real stuff in rhythm, I have time not only for random meetings, but for making progress on my callings. Sometimes I'm asked how I find time in my busy teaching schedule to write books. What I say is this, when it comes to what you want to do with your life, an hour and a half Tuesday morning means something. Sometime this year doesn't. Sometime this lifetime really doesn't. I think what I'm going for is joy, more so than happiness. The hope is for more than a preponderance of positive experiences. When I think about my own callings, it's a little awkward to describe them as forms of happiness. Fatherhood is hard. Teaching, especially at a community college, is hard. Writing is hard. All these activities, when I'm committed to them, open me up to failure, confusion, despair, and heartbreak. 
Even though they also have big payoffs, it's not clear that a pleasure paying accounting of them would lead to their endorsement. For that matter, it's far from clear that a pleasure paying accounting of being human would lead to its endorsement. But these callings open me up to joy. Rilke puts it well, the reality of any joy in the world is indescribable. Only in joy does creation happen. Happiness, on the contrary, is only a promising and interpretable pattern of what already exists. Joy is a pure addition out of nothingness. How superficially must happiness engage us, after all, if it can leave us time to think and worry about how long it will last? Joy is a moment unobligated, timeless from the beginning, not to be held, but also not to be truly lost again since under its impact our being is changed chemically, so to speak. The only thing I'd change about Rilke's formulation is the idea of joy as a moment. There are certainly joyful moments, but I think that certain things are joys. Not just that they contain joys, but that they are joy itself. Sure, raising children has its unobligated, timeless sparkles, but isn't it also fair to say that children are joys? There's some strange, jubilant yes that mysteriously overwhelms all their weighty negatives. A line by the theologian Alexander Schmemann gets at my idea. He says, the future, he says, the knowledge of the fallen world does not kill joy, which emanates in this world always, constantly, as a bright sorrow. Strangely enough, that's what I long for in life, to be plugged into the hardships that glow with jewel-like beauty, a bright sorrow, the art of shining. So here's my revisionary bucket list. I want to use the gift of my consciousness to pay attention to this earthly existence. I want to establish myself and contribute to the world by pursuing my callings. I want to find a rhythm in how I spend my time such that I can perform the essential verbs with some panache. And I want to open myself up to joy, the joy that is inextricable from the suffering world. Though I hope my speculations about attention, calling, rhythm, and joy are useful to you, all the real work of shining is in your hands. Philosophy, in my view, isn't about handing over the answers, but about inviting people on journeys. Plus, I've left out a lot. I haven't talked of virtue, the great lesson of Confucius and Aristotle, and perhaps also the great lesson of all our relationships. I haven't talked of the acceptance that transcends our happy ending wishes, the great lesson of the Taoists and the Stoics, and perhaps also the great lesson of age. I've overlooked, even contradicted, insights that you and you alone have into our manners and our mysteries. My mentor, Donald Philip Vereen, likes to quote Hugo Grotius in The Rights of War and Peace from 1625. If anything here has been said by me, inconsistent with piety, with good morals, or with any aspect of the truth, let it be as if unsaid. How do you know if you're on the right path? One clue I found is that when I get closer to life, or whatever you want to call the whole shebang, I find myself using words like soul and mystery. When I pay attention and experience joy, I'm seduced by words like beauty and even eternity. I sometimes want to capitalize them. I mostly don't know what people mean when they prattle on about God, but when the rare soul uses the word God with believability, it's the paradigm of a proper name for being's fullness and overfulness. It worries me that we shy from these words. It's especially troubling that contemporary philosophers balk at them, like they're embarrassed to drop the beauty bomb or the eternity bomb in respectable company. Do we really want to live with scare quotes around our souls? It's like we're living in the outbuilding of reality rather than in the weird old mansion itself. But even more than to find the inspiration behind words like soul and eternity, I want to be able to say the most basic words and have them mean their meaning. Words like I and love, and you, and I, and am, and here. I want each of these words to carry their full weight, but also to be able to spread their wings and soar. The word I, how crazy and strange to have an utterly unique identity, to have this inward life that spills its colors everywhere. The word love, are you kidding me in this brutal world? 
Actually, yes, yes, it is a real verb. Maybe the real verb, especially in this brutal world. The word you, another I but not me, the reality that makes possible language, tragedy, politics, and most of all, love, the reality that makes possible me, it can't be, yet it is, it is a zillion times over. The verb to be, are you kidding me? Since I've been 10 years old, I haven't been able to get over why there's being rather than nothing. And here, what the fuck? What a mind-blowing thing here is. Like some foreign god with a million faces and 10 million fingers. A protean god constantly spiraling through forms that rhyme but never quite repeat. So don't even get me started on time's infinite puzzle. Death surrounds words like I and you, maybe all words and makes them shine like candles in Georges de la Tour paintings. My blathering on about calling, attention, rhythm, and joy is just a way of trying to talk me and maybe you into remembering these luminous words, these luminous realities before it's too late. I love you. I am here. I've spoken of moving from our forget about it attitude to a face it attitude when it comes to death because I believe we should wake up to what matters. However, maybe when we really live well, we come to adopt a nonchalant attitude again. Maybe our body can absorb so much of the world's splendor and give to the world so much of our uniqueness that our name gets cleanly registered in the book of life and the dragon of self-doubt simply vanishes. Maybe the end of the art of shining is to become blasé about our death, regarding it as just one more thing in the rhythm of the weeks. Maybe a fellow seeker will one day overhear us saying to a loved one, I'm dying, it's nothing big. Maybe we can achieve something of my hero, Michelle de Montaigne's wisdom, when he says, I want death to find me planting my cabbages, careless of death and still more of my unfinished garden. Maybe the essential rhythm is to forget, to fix, to face, then to forget again. Maybe. At the beginning of my talk, I promised to tell you what I was writing on my computer when I heard the ruckus in the Dallas airport and ran over to help the slumped over woman. You might not believe me because reality is often too fitting to be real, but let's not be so dull as to disbelieve the unbelievable. Sometimes a sunset really does look just like a painting of a sunset. <laughs> I was just doodling around with possible endings for my talk on the value of studying the humanities. What I was haphazardly composing, it turns out, synthesizes all I've been thinking in the face of death about attention, calling, rhythm, and joy. Believe it or not, what I composed right before I held the head of a dying fellow passenger was this. When Socrates was just a few days from facing his death sentence, he took up learning the flute. A friend asked him why he bothered with his execution so close. Socrates calmly replied, to learn this tune before dying. So when anyone asks skeptically of your education, what are you going to do with that? Just smile and say, I don't want to die without knowing the tune. Thank you. Well, I'm, I, I would, one of the things I like best about being able to give talks is really just to have conversations afterwards. And while I hope some of you come to the uh, uh, reception tonight and we can just talk informally, or maybe over a drink, uh, we have some time right now to have some conversation as well. So maybe you have questions or comments or things that you have to add to, to this kind of discussion. Um, so I'd love to hear from you. And also, I think, you know, if anyone's uh, uh, out there on, on line watching, I think I can maybe, you can t type in stuff and we can get your question potentially uh, uh, that way too. So I would love to hear from some of you if you have things to say.
Thank you for your talk. I appreciate your comments about finding your calling. Do you have any advice for students who are looking for their calling and trying to figure out what that might be? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's something on my mind, and I can't say I have a perfect answer, though I'm, I've been thinking a lot about it. Um, I, you know, I, I sort of allude to it a little bit in my talk, but I, I really actually do think that a, a little bit of unplugging is going to be a good thing. I don't know that you can fully know yourself when people who have it in them to try to manipulate and our artificial intelligence that has it in it to manipulate everything about us at all times is constantly distracting us or, or even driving us one place or another. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of kind of traditional ways that people can find things. I think travel can be a great thing, sometimes getting out of your normal circumstances where you can start to figure out who am I outside of the expectations around me. Um, but I also just think that it's, it's, it's a matter, I, I, like I said, I, I tend to think that we have it in us to kind of know where we're going. It's just a matter of really trusting in that and committing to that. Um, for me, at least, you know, going to college and being part of a liberal arts education was hugely important for me to see, you know, not just the possibilities for jobs, but to see the possibilities for how human beings have done things and to see new styles of living, um, uh, to meet friends who helped me to kind of know myself better. All of those kinds of things were, were hugely important in, in, in finding that. And, and like I said, I think it takes a certain amount of courage. I, I, I often know students who feel like they have it in them to do something, but then they're like, well, but you know, I don't know that I should really do that. I should probably go down this road instead. And, you know, and maybe at times that's a wise choice. I don't know. But, um, but sometimes it takes a little bit of courage to be willing to take that risk so that you can find yourself. If everything is about the safety of right choices, I don't know that it's possible to. I don't know. What do you think? Do you have some advice? <laughs> I think it would work, it would take me to work hard at it. Mm -hmm. Probably work hard at it. Of course. Of course. On the other side of the hall, I will just run around. You're right next to me. I don't have to stand up, do I? No. Okay, no, good. Uh, well, you meant. Uh, you don't have to stand up to the other side. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, you were talking about like uh, social media and stuff and unplugging. Uh, well, uh, I don't know if this is really a question. It's more of something to add. Like how we kind of like when we're on social media and stuff, we tend to like box ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when you're on Twitter and you're saying certain things or on Pinterest or anything, you label yourself. You're like, well, I'm a liberal. I have to think this way. Mm -hmm. I'm a... Uh, I'm creative, I do this, I'm not like scientific or anything. And so like we box ourselves into certain things so we can't really expand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that that's right. I think, I mean, there's, there's, there's a whole talk or whole shelf of books to be said about the kinds of dangers that things like social media pose. And I, I don't want to come across as being saying that they're altogether bad. I think they're probably okay ways of doing them. I just don't know that you can really find yourself if that's, where you're always swimming. I think if you found yourself and you have some sense of who you are, it's a lot easier to engage with that stuff meaningfully. Though even that seems to be posing a lot of problems for people. Um, it's amazing how much just kind of rage and rancor fills people on the basis of, of, of engaging in that kind of a world. But, um, but I think as a young person, it, it really is important to get out of those boxes a little bit that, that really everyone's trying to put you in and that maybe you're trying to put yourself in. Um, like I said, it, it promises a virtual identity, but not a real identity. And I don't know that, that we can ever really, you know, come to close to facing death if that's all we have. I'll go here because it's okay. closer, but I'll come back there in a second. Um, first of all, let me say thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I notice on your list of images that you have a lot of musicians, yeah. um, particularly drummers. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so uh, you repeated the phrase a few times, the rhythm of your week or the rhythm mm -hmm. of your life. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, in one sense, I mean something maybe very straightforward, and maybe in another sense, I mean something a little bit more than that. But I, I certainly do think that most of us are habit-oriented creatures who are going, you know, the, 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 like I said, if we start by saying, what's our life going to be like? Really, honestly, it's going to be like what our habitual patterns are on, the, on a day-to-day, week-by-week basis. Like I said, I like to think in terms of a week, because I can kind of structure that out for the most part. And so I feel like those habits create you know, rhythms for us, but I feel like the rhythms can be, you know, these very hectic, harried things or things that almost feel like you're out of sync with, with what's going on versus trying to find that rhythm. And I, and I feel like it's, it's, there's a kind of almost intuitive sense that you have to do with knowing something about yourself and figuring out what, you know, even something simple like how much sleep you need or, you know, when you need to have a little downtime or whatever, um, let alone trying to find the rhythms of doing the meaningful things that, that uh, um, make a difference. But I really do feel like there's something more to it, too. Like, I love this image of, um, of uh, Joe Jones, the great um, uh, drummer for the Count Basie uh, Orchestra. That's Keith Moon. There he is. Because, um, I mean, he just looks so calm, you know? Like, he just seems, and you know, they could just swing like crazy. and. And you know, you just you, you feel like he's he's plugged into the rhythm. He, he's coming alive in some ways with the rhythm, and it feels like he just has time to spare at all times. Like there seems to be very leisurely about him. Um, my dissertation director, Donald Philip Breen, he was like that. Like he just always seemed to be relaxed um, about what he did, and he got done. He, you know, he was he was always accomplishing things, getting stuff done, but he always had time to talk to someone. He always had time to, you know, share a meal with people. Um, and it was like, a lot of people were amazed by this, like, how can he do all that? Well, I think it's because he found some kind of rhythm in his life where all of a sudden he, he didn't feel like he was being controlled by something that was uh, outside of him, but he felt as if he had found the kinds of things that really opened him up and made him blossom. I do feel like, you know, uh, the great traditions of American music, they give us all sorts of like little clues there about finding those, those rhythms. Um, but I, there's something almost mystical about it, maybe. I apologize if it is, but... Um, the beauty of philosophy is we're never totally off topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you thought there was a particular reason why, like, if somebody does pass for an untimely death, like the lady in the airport, why one of her loved ones might take over her bucket list. Do you think it's more of a grief-related kind of thing, or is it more to postpone the fact that they have died? Why well, don't does, you tell me? Does that that happens that people will mm -hmm. sort of take over someone else's bucket list? Yeah. I had the unfortunate experience of one of my classmates died in high school, mm -hmm. and shortly after his death was summer, mm -hmm. so his brother actually took over his bucket list because mm -hmm. we'd had to make one earlier in the semester. Mm -hmm. So that entire semester, he went out with his friends and the brother's friends, and they all went and completed his bucket list. Hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's moving. It's a moving thing. I, I, you know, in a different vein, but perhaps speaking to the same impulse, uh, one of my, another one of my big heroes is this Polish poet and, and writer, Zbigniew Herbert. And he has an essay at one point where he's talking about, he, he lived through World War II, and, and he was thinking about all the people who died in World War II, all the people who were massacred in World War II. And at some point, he, he, he talks about how he, f he felt a kind of burden on him to be present to the world and to really, in, you know, take in the things, the great things of life, precisely because of all the dead who'd been deprived of that very experience. Um, I don't know. There's something kind of beautiful to me about the, the idea of, of our connection to others and, and that how the dead do make claims on us that... that, that, um, uh, that that the, 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 I don't know that we can fully leave behind the dead. And, I, and it seems to me a, a fully human life doesn't, doesn't lose track of, of those who've gone before us, both what they achieved and what they never were able to achieve. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to say other than that it's, it, to me it speaks to an important connection that we have to, to those who, who died. One more question. Okay, two more questions. So I was... The thing about the, the, the boxes, I was sort of thinking about that. And I, I want, everything you've stated is sort of 
agree with, but I'm, I'm thinking about, there's, there's a book uh, about suicide in early, in early modern England called Sleepless Souls, mm -hmm. and it has this amazing chapter about um, suicide notes. Mm -hmm. um, and those suicide notes, it turns out, follow the, the most individual thing you could do, but they follow the patterns of literature and stuff mm -hmm. uh, from the period, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. isn't, to some degree, to be social, to be human, is to be boxed in, mm -hmm. is to be mm -hmm. following whatever is going on at the time and all. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that, you know, getting the, the, the social media is these, these societies, mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't know that, I mean, I want to agree with everything you said, but isn't that sort of a fact that that's, that's there? You know, so yeah, I, I want to get rid of the thing that is mm -hmm. makes you human. Yeah, well, I think you're right. I mean, at some level, we are uh, um, both we're limited by our cultures, but in a way, those limits empower us in other ways. Um, uh, I mean, you know, obviously, we need a language even to write a suicide note, let alone a form of how to use it. And I'm I'm sure that it makes sense to me that we we will always draw on what's around us. Um, but I I guess I still want to be able to discriminate between you know, some healthy and unhealthy ways of, of being boxed in, to use the way you're putting it, of, of being part of that culture. And again, I don't, uh, like my point about, say, you know, social media is boxing us in and all, is, is not to say that, that we should just not use it at all at any time or that it's just 100% bad or all together ruinous. It's just a matter of, I think, we have to be alert to the question of how can we use it well? How can, how can these things use us versus how, how might we actually use them in ways that are, that are productive and healthy. And maybe at times that means not using them, or maybe there are better ways that we can do of, 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 of doing it. Or even like, you know, I, 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 one of the things I tried to do with this talk was use some images that I hope were, were stimulating to people um, and a lot of photography. Uh, to me, I think photography is another small example of what I'm talking about. I find a lot of the photography that goes on in our world to be really deadening, just people cutting themselves off from their experience as they just simply chink, 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 and it's sort of like, it's like they'll be like, well, I'll enjoy the experience later someday down the road. And <laughs> I've got, you know, like, I, I'll, I got it in my back pocket, you know, if I ever want to enjoy the experience. And, you know, so I think that's really bad. But I'm not saying photography is bad. I actually think photography can be a really incredible way of paying attention to the world and, and, and connecting us to people. It's just a matter of, you know, there's, there's going to be a way that we use it that, that, that is part of what I'm calling the art of shining and a way that kind of covers up that, 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 that light. So uh, my question relates to the previous two questions, and that is um, your uh, philosophy is appears to be very individualist, at least what you've presented. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned virtue yeah. um, at the end. Uh, I'm thinking about you know the relationships that we have with other people, the fact that we don't always get to uh, define our own mm -hmm. identities, right. um, the responsibilities that we have to people in the airports or to our loved ones who leave us behind. So could could you just say maybe in you know five sentences <laughs> how, <laughs> how how a, a system of ethics or virtue might sort of interface with this individualist philosophy that you've presented? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question, and um, I, I I guess I see these things as 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 like a, a balance. I don't know that I, I feel like we have to have both, you know. Um, I, you know, I, I talked about at the end in my own way of saying, you know, like just to be able to say I love you and I am here as to me some of the most powerful things we have to say, which means that we actually are in relationship with others. We're there for them. We're able to express, you know, the, the best of who we are to them. Um, and so I, you know, I, I it, but that also seems to me that that means that you have to be able to be the kind of person you are so that you can be there for them. But then on the flip side, it's kind of like, well, you can't really be the person you are except for being enmeshed in a whole set of relationships around us. Um, um, uh, in my book, Seven Ways of Looking at Pointless Suffering, I have a chapter on Confucius. And it seems to me he gives a really beautiful account of just how deeply relational we are and that we can't really even think of ourselves outside of our relationships and to find productive forms of relationship are almost, is almost the most 
powerful you know, way of being fully human um, in ways that take us beyond, like I said, mere happiness, but open us up to something else that goes far beyond that. Um, to me, that idea of calling, like I said, off for most of us has to do with, with listening to what those roles mean, like you know, being a father for me or being a teacher. Um, you know, it means that I, I have to be very attuned to, to something outside of myself, but also how to manage both sides of that relationship. So I, I definitely think that the relational aspects of things are very important, and you're right, my, my talk doesn't perhaps give that enough weight overall, but, um, uh, uh, but nonetheless, I, I feel as if, I, at least for me, maybe there's something just deeply kind of Western about it, but I, I feel very much like I want to have an individual identity um, as well. Okay, that's it. They're kicking us out. No more questions. So, thank you very much. Reception afterwards.